Our second keynote speaker of the conference holds the Chancellor's Distinguished Professorship in Physics at UCSD. He's a theoretical physicist whose work is wide ranging and whose Twitter bio says, I'm interested in everything. Before joining UCSD, he was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for over 30 years, where he led the biocomplexity group uh, within the Carl R. Woese Institute for Genomic Biology, and where he both founded and directed the NASA Astrobiology Institute for Universal Biology. His research has been highly multidisciplinary, ranging from condensed matter and hydrodynamics to the ecology and evolution of living systems. Among his many accolades, Nigel received the 2020 Leo P. Kadanoff Prize from the American Physical Society for, quote, profound contributions to the fields of superconductivity, fluid turbulence, and dynamical pattern formation. It's been a pleasure to have him as a professor, and it's a pleasure to have him with us here today. Please welcome Nigel Goldenfeld. Thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation to speak at the AbgradCon. Um, I love this conference. I've sent my students to it. I've been in it before. I think it's absolutely wonderful, and I was really thrilled to see that uh, NASA is uh, still supporting it, and even to, uh, to, uh, to catch up with uh, an old uh, friend and, and acquaintance from my days at the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Hi, Mike. So I'm going to talk about something that, uh, that uh, by all rights, uh, shouldn't exist. Uh, and I don't mean life itself, um, I mean uh, universal aspects of living systems. I am a physicist, as you heard from the introduction, and so uh, my approach to anything is, uh, is ridiculously uh, simple and is almost surely destined uh, for failure, but uh, we try to fail in a, in a grand way and, and at least see what we can learn uh, from our attempts to understand uh, the, the physical principles that govern uh, life. So I'm going to talk about universal biology, the genetic code, and the first billion years of life on Earth. And uh, I have uh, uh, collaborators. Um, my first collaborator I want to mention is uh, Carl Woese, who will feature in this story. Uh, many of you may know Carl Woese. He discovered uh, the archaea. He was a, a very famous uh, evolutionary biologist, and he was my mentor when I started uh, doing biology about 20 years ago. Uh, Colin Vetsigian uh, uh, was one of my graduate students who did uh, uh, fantastic work on, on the genetic code and was in fact also at the uh, University of Wisconsin where Alex uh, was as a, as a student before. Um, uh, Farshid Jaffapur is now uh, at, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands and Tommaso Biancalani is, at, uh, is now working in uh, Genentech here in California. All right, so I'm going to tell you about work that was done uh, uh, over the last... Uh, uh, 10, or 10 or 15 years or so um, uh, through the NASA Astrobiology Institute, and I hope you're going to find it interesting. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt uh, during, the, during the talk, especially if it's a clarification, uh, and I'll, be, of course, be happy to take questions uh, as, as, as we go through uh, to the end. So the thing I want to understand is what are the sorts of evolutionary transitions that life must inevitably pass through. This is part of a program that, uh, that NASA uh, uh, discussed in their marvelous astrobiology roadmap from about 15 years ago, trying to understand uh, universal biology and look for universal characteristics of, of life. And the idea is, if we can understand what features of life on Earth are not idiosyncratic, but are actually just something that we should expect on other planets, then understanding these processes, understanding these transitions may help us to come up with uh, biosignatures, and uh, we'll see that, in fact, uh, there is some uh, prospect for that. So I want to understand Basically, can we understand some features of life, universal features, which you may say may not exist, but we'll see, we'll see it's the contrary, and uh, can we understand them from general dynamical principles without necessarily having to worry about all the chemical details? So I'm going to talk about two things in this talk. I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, canonical genetic code, and that's going to be most, the most of, of my talk. Um, I will talk about biological homochirality uh, because it is important as a, as a biosignature. It's been assumed to be a biosignature, but, um, but actually we'll see in this talk that actually there are dynamical reasons for thinking that homochirality is an inevitable outcome of, of, of living systems. So I want to first start off, though, by uh, talking about are there any universal features in biology and, uh, and, and how should we think about them? So I'm a physicist, so I start off by asking is there universality in physics? 
So here's an example. This is thermal conductivity uh, of various uh, glassy materials. So this is raw data. And then uh, when we process it in a certain way, the data from different materials all collapse onto one uh, universal curve, except for this regime over here. And so that's something that we try to understand if we want to understand glassy, uh, mat glassy materials. Um, here's another example, which is a much better one. Uh, this example is looking at the magnetic field uh, or the magnetization in a magnet exposed to an external magnetic field H at temperature T um, as you go through the ferromagnetic phase transition, the transition that makes stuff be magnetic at low temperatures and not magnetic at high temperatures. And you, the data you take from uh, different external magnetic fields, different uh, uh, temperatures, and then if you process the data in the right way, all these data from five different materials, none of which uh, look, look anything alike, all fall onto one universal curve, and, uh, the, and the prediction for that curve is the solid line, which goes embarrassingly close to all the data, and it has no adjustable parameters. So that's another example of, uh, of, of scaling and universality in physics. And you might say, well, this is, this is really great, because what did the physicists do? They made a model of a magnetic system, and then they took that model, worked out its consequences, did some calculations, and then showed that it gave a precise prediction in agreement with experiments. That's what physicists usually do. In fact, it's nothing like that at all. Well, actually it is. It's a model of a model of a model of a model of a model, and that, <laughs> that does all the work. Uh, the first model is a model of quantum chemistry, then there's a model of electronic structure, then there's a model of the dipole moments on the electronic spins, uh, that uses quantum mechanics, and then you say, well, quantum mechanics is too hard, so let's get rid of quantum mechanics, so then you have a classical, and you still can't do it, and then you make some sort of approximation that physicists to call Landau theory, and then you, you get the results that I showed you. And the thing you want, I want you to understand, the reason why I'm... Uh, tormenting you with this physics stuff is because every step along the way here is a non-systematic approximation. You cannot justify these approximations starting from first principles, from the Schrodinger equation, or whatever else it is. So the point is, here is an example of how a ludicrously simple model that has no right to actually be able to describe reality actually describes it precisely. And we know in this case why it works. It works in this case because of a thing called renormalization group theory, which Ken Wilson won the Nobel Prize for inventing in the 1980s. And so we understand how all these approximations that we made threw away stuff that really doesn't matter for the thing that we were trying to calculate. So, that's the, uh, so that, that tells you that it is not impossible to make ludicrously simple models and still have some understanding of how the system actually behaves. Okay, so we're going to, of course, apply that type of modeling philosophy uh, to biology. But first of all, let's ask another question. So for me as a physicist, I want to know, do we learn new physics when we study biology? Or is it just insanely complicated material science? Are they universal phenomena? Do they reveal anything important? And what do we miss by not understanding universal phenomena? Okay. I'm going to show you that there are universal phenomena. Some of you will be very surprised at the examples I'm going to show you. I'm also going to show you that if we don't understand these universal phenomena, not only can we not understand how life started at all and how it evolved, we certainly can't understand how to do things like respond to a pandemic or deal with antibiotic resistance or herbicide resistance or cancer. All of these things depend on understanding uh, evolution and these universal properties. Okay, so let's talk about universal biology. So, so uh, let me give you an example here. So this was, a, this was a, a headline on the NASA website at some point in 2013, about 10 years ago. Mystery of the missing waves on Titan. So basically, people knew that from looking at the, uh, at, uh, the fluid mechanics and, and the atmosphere of Titan, that there should be uh, waves on, on the surface of Titan, um, and, uh, and uh, so there was a mystery. They weren't there. We couldn't see them. Nobody knew why. And then uh, about a year later, uh, Cassini spies the wind-rippled waves uh, on Titan. So, so suddenly, sigh of relief, thank goodness, you, you, you can sleep at night. We found the waves on the surface of the oceans of, of Titan. Okay, so that's a real, real headline, okay? Here's, what, here's one that you have. Oh, okay. 
forget, I forgot this. We know the waves on the ocean of Titan are missing because there's a general theory of two-phase fluid flow interfaces that predict waves and their dispersion characteristics. So we knew what to look for. Okay, here's a headline that you didn't see. Mystery of the missing life on Titan, and then definitely not this one, Cassini spies the long-sought life on Titan. Okay, anybody seen that headline? It never occurred, okay? And it's a joke, right? Because it's a joke because we don't know if there's missing life because we don't have a theory that predicts the existence of life as a physical phenomena. So that's the first thing. Why does life as a phenomenon exist? And we certainly don't understand what sort of life can exist in different uh, environments. So, so, um, so, so, so actually, going back, to, going back to Cassini, Cassini may indeed have actually seen life, but not on Titan. It may have seen life uh, on Enceladus. Okay, so how many people here know about Enceladus? Great, a lot more, <laughs> a lot more people than would at a typical physics colloquium, right? So, so good. So, so as you know, Enceladus uh, is, a, is, a, is an isolated world orbiting Saturn. Um, it uh, has a global ocean of liquid water underneath the ice, and we know that because we can see how it wobbles, and because of the way it wobbles, we can detect that there must be life underneath, that there must be water underneath. And it also obligingly has a crack in the ice, lots of cracks. And so water squirts out through the cracks. And so you've got a fountain, a huge fountain, and you can fly satellites through the fountain, and you can look at the water that you, uh, that you pick up. And uh, that water, uh, you can analyze its chemistry, and its chemistry looks very similar to what we might see at an alkaline hydrothermal vent here on Earth. So we, Cassini wasn't instrumented for looking at life, uh, but we may have seen some signatures of life uh, uh, through that experiment. So what is universal biology? Well, universal biology is the idea that we are interested in general principles and not specific carbon chemistry details. And so we want to develop a theory of universal biology divorced from idiosyncratic details of the actual chemistry and the, and the uh, geological context and so on. And uh, this will involve uh, abstractions, and, uh, and we use abstractions all the time in, in biology, and we'll talk about one of those in a minute. So on this slide is pretty much all we know about universal biology. So any, can, are you looking at it carefully? Uh, there's, there's not much there. So let's talk instead about something where we do have an understanding, and that is universal computation. So I want to tell you now about what, we, what uh, uh, universal biology would look like if we could do it, and I use as a model uh, um, a computer. So here's a picture of my computer, or something close to my computer. Here's another computer. This one you can see uh, a few hundred miles up the road at the Museum of Computation in Mountain View, or in my case, I saw it at the Science Museum in London. This is a computer made out of cogwheels and springs, uh, designed and partially built by George Babbage in the 1900s. It is the authentic steampunk uh, artifact. These two things are the same. They're the same algorithmically. This thing uh, over here, the left-hand side, is a computer, and you know that it's uh, not uh, just a shiny chunk of glass, plastic, and silicon. It's actually a universal Turing machine. The thing on the right is also a Turing machine because it has conditional branching in its instruction set, and so it can be shown that it can be mapped onto a universal uh, Turing machine. So in fact, the two things are the same, uh, although one of them is uh, many times faster than the other. So a Turing machine with a von Neumann architecture is really what a computer is, and we have hardware to instantiate uh, that, uh, that algorithm. So the medium is not the message. Uh, here is uh, John von Neumann standing in front of uh, another computer that he built at the Institute for Advanced Study in the 1950s. In this computer, it's built out of thermionic valves. Um, it's built out of uh, uh, relays and switches. And so neither this nor this, we're seeing here the evolution of computational hardware, but in all of these machines, they all do the same thing. They're all universal Turing machines. And so if we're looking at life, we should be thinking about life as making a progression, as you see over here, um, but executing the same sort of uh, algorithmic processes. Now, is there new physical laws in, uh, in biology? Well, uh, Schrodinger and Delbruck were the first physicists to work in biology, and uh, their partial motivation was to find new physical laws. They were thinking about quantum mechanics in the 1930s, as, as they might see some deviations from quantum mechanics or something like that. 
But today, we, not many people, well, some people think that could be still true, but most of us think that uh, the real big question is trying to understand emergence and the existence of life itself. How is it that matter, at molecules and atoms, uh, self-organize, hierarchically, create replicating and evolvable structures? We don't have a clue about how that happens. How do molecules come to life? So if we want to understand biology in the same way that we understand physical phenomena, we need to understand the existence and not just the specific realization of, uh, of living systems. And I'm going to take the perspective here that living systems are dynamical systems that are able to reprogram themselves. So let's think about that. So here is the, uh, here is the fortune cookie. The program is the data, the data is the program. Okay. This is Niels Baricelli, who was uh, the first uh, person to write a computer virus. He was working at the Institute for Advanced Study, and at, in the day, while John von Neumann was using the computer, one of the first computers, to uh, uh, solve the equations of hydrodynamics, uh, to design uh, hydrogen bombs, uh, Niels Baricelli went in at night and uh, made uh, um, uh, computer viruses and then had them compete and, and uh, evolve with each other inside a fixed ecosystem, which was the memory of the, uh, of the computer. And he, uh, he understood well, that what he was seeing here uh, was, uh, was actually many of the phenomena that we see in evolving, uh, evolvable ecosystems. So what do self-programming systems uh, can do? Well, living systems have the capacity to evolve and evolving systems can reprogram themselves so they're able to respond to perturbations by creating new functionality. That is the defining characteristic of living systems. And this is very different from physical systems or engineered systems, which are by a fixed or predetermined uh, equation of motion or, or, or behavior. So the future state of an evolvable system is inherently unpredictable and never, maybe girdle undecidable, don't worry about that. And so this, this, uh, this, this feature means that it's very difficult to control uh, evolving systems. And we'll come to that, uh, we'll turn to that at, at the end of the talk. Now, what do most biologists do? Well, most biologists uh, uh, do something uh, rather strange. You could call it the inverse problem. Imagine that you came down from Mars and I gave you my computer and you had no idea what this thing was. What would you be able to do to figure out that this thing is not just a, an expensive doorstop, but actually is a universal Turing machine with a von Neumann architecture? It would be very, very different, very, very difficult to figure out from the electronic circuits and uh, the hardware and so on, that that's what the thing actually did. And so what we want to do in biology is we have the inverse problem. The biology is already created, and we want to understand what is the abstract theory of which it is an instantiation. And that abstract theory would underline all systems that exhibit the characteristics of life. So could you, could you if you didn't know about the universal Turing machines with a von Neumann architecture, could you deduce that theoretical framework just by somebody giving you uh, a highly evolved uh, computer? Okay, we've talked about abstraction, so now let's get down to a real abstraction. So I want to talk about the genetic code. And I, I frequently find that people uh, from uh, various uh, wide-ranging audiences don't quite know what I mean when I talk about the genetic code. So let's just take a pause uh, to, uh, to go through that. So in the modern world, as you know, uh, DNA uh, contains uh, our genome. Uh, the DNA is built from four nucleotide uh, uh, bases. Uh, RNA polymerase uh, reads uh, the, the gene coding uh, segments and spits out uh, mRNA. That's also built from four nucleotide bases. And then the ribosomes go along with the mRNA and they spit out the proteins and they choose which proteins should go into the protein uh, sorry, they choose which amino acid should go into the proteins from the code uh, that they're reading from the, uh, from the mRNA. And the way they read that code is they read it in triplets, so uh, A, U, G, A, C, A, G, 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 and so on. These are codon triplets of, of, um, of nucleotide bases. And the genetic code, it tells you, if you read this thing here, what uh, amino acid uh, is going to go the, into the... Uh, into the protein that you are building. And so this is a sort of cartoon here of the whole translation process. And you're supposed to think of this huge machine uh, moving along uh, like so. So just to summarize what the genetic code is, it's a map. 
It's the map used by the ribosome to translate the message from RNA triplets of four bases into the 20 amino acids of life. And, uh, and, and we're going to discuss uh, how that code uh, evolved. Now, this is Carl Woese sitting uh, in his office on, uh, and on the New York Times front page, Thursday, November the 3rd, 1977. Why is he there? Well, it says here, scientists discover a form of life that predates higher organisms. Um, I guess uh, fake news is not just a new invention. It happened, uh, it happened back in the 70s as well. This is partially true, not, 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 not quite true. But in any case, he had discovered uh, the, uh, the uh, archaea. So let me just tell you uh, what he had discovered. So this is the tree of life. This is from a paper by Norm Pace in 97. Uh, you can see here there are three domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and uh, the eukaryotes. Uh, you are over here. Virtually everything else here is, uh, is microbial. And, uh, the, and this, this, this phylogenetic tree is a kind of map. It's built, it's been elaborated on by now, and there's, 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 uh, it's, it's out of date, and there's uh, some debates about whether there's two domains or three domains and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, this is what, uh, what he discovered. Now, how did he, uh, how did he discover this? Well, what he did was looked for patterns in, uh, in, in molecular sequences from parts of the ribosome, the 16S small subunit of the ribosome, and by looking at those sequences, was able to look at do, uh, the, the, what, what today we would call comparative genomics and map out uh, the, the, this tree of life. And somewhere around here is uh, the last universal common ancestor of the last universal common ancestral community. So this is the paper that they wrote in, in 1977, and uh, the, the, the mystery that this, uh, this, uh, this work um, uh, left us with is the following. We know that the planet is about uh, 4.6 billion years old. We know that uh, the, the last universal common ancestor, even then, was, uh, was dated to at least 3 billion years. Today, we think it's about 3.6, 3.8 billion years, depending on, on who you're talking to, based on uh, static, um, you, you know, um, uh, um, what do you call them? Um, you know, various geological evidence uh, and, and so on, stromatolites and so on. Um, so, so basically, but some, something like this. But, but the point that, that, that Woes and Fox were making is that for a lot of the, of the time, the planet was inhospitable to life. You had less than a billion years in which life could evolve, and it evolved the complexity of something like the modern cell in, le in less than a billion years. And then after that, there wasn't very much cellular evolution, maybe dinosaurs and multicellularity and things like that. But from the point of view of the architecture of the cell, uh, very little. So, so what, uh, what uh, uh, Woes and Fox, uh, here's some pictures of them doing their work at the time. Uh, what, they, what, they, uh, what they wrote was that, uh, that uh, it wasn't that the evolution speeded up at the beginning and then slowed down uh, the last universal common ancestor. What they wrote was that actually maybe evolution had a different character um, in, in its early phases. And we're going to see that there is evidence for that. Now, what kind of different mode could there be of evolution? Well, most of us, uh, if, when you think about evolution, you think about what is really called vertical evolution. That is, you have your genes, uh, you give your genes to your children, they give their genes to their children, and so on and so forth. And so there's a, a transfer of genetic material of genes uh, through the generations. Horizontal gene transfer is a, is a different thing altogether. Horizontal gene transfer is the transfer of genes from one organism to another that it is not related to. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is what happens uh, in, uh, in, uh, in bacteria. There's three ways that this can, are known to happen here on Earth. Uh, genes can be transmitted through viruses, uh, through direct contact, or through uptake of free DNA from the environment. So the question is, what happens when all the, all the uh, microbes in the world do this? What happens when all of early life is able to, uh, to transfer genes? OK, let me just give you two quick uh, uh, anecdotes about that. So this here is a uh, cyanophage. It's a, it's a phage that in, in, infects uh, Prochlorococcus, one of the most abundant organisms on the planet. 
And, uh, and, and this here is a, is a phylogenetic tree of, the, of a gene that is involved in, in, the, in photosystem 2. And if you can read phylogenetic trees, it doesn't matter if you can't, but if you can read them, what this shows you is that this gene was transferred back and forth between a virus and the bacterial host multiple times during evolution. And in fact, uh, the, 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 the group that discovered this, uh, Sullivan et al. in Penny Chisholm's lab, uh, they wrote that uh, host-like genes acquired by phages undergo a period of diversification in phage genomes and serve as a genetic reservoir for their hosts. So the idea is, I have a gene that is a photosynthesis gene. That, that gene helps uh, in photosynthesis. Uh, that gene uh, gets transferred by a viral attack to phage. In phage, that gene can evolve much more rapidly because there are less um, proof readings and things like this that go on in phage replication. So as a result, the bacteria are, uh, get infected by new genes from the phage, but those genes have evolved much more rapidly in the phage than they would in the bacteria. And so there's a, there's a mechanism by which you can have rapid evolutionary change mediated by phage or by other mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer. And because that is a network effect, it's extraordinarily efficient. And, uh, and um, I, I'm not going to have time to show you work that we did actually modeling that, that whole process. Now, this is the, uh, the uh, with that having said that and told you about that other mode of transfer, let me now tell you about the genetic code. So here is the uh, genetic code. So the way you read it is like this, you, you, and then the, the first column up here. So that brings you to this uh, cell, that's phenylalanine, and you can do the same thing for all of these. Of course, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a code of triplets of uh, four uh, nucleotide bases, an alphabet of four. So in principle, there are 64 things you could code for, but there's only 20 amino acids. So the code is redundant, and, uh, uh, but it's not just redundant, it also has structure. So if you look here, these are the most hydrophobic amino acids, these are the most hydrophilic ones, and you can see that in the way that this code is written, uh, there is structure here. The amino acids uh, have, uh, are segmented in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this genetic code table. So one of the things that Carl Woese did back in the 1960s was to measure a quantity that he called polar requirement, which measured this balance between hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity and gave a single number, which is small up over here and large uh, over here. And, uh, and so he was able to quantify that chemical difference. Now, you all know that the genetic code is pretty much universal. It's not exactly universal. There's small variations and stop codons, but it's basically universal. But what I want to tell you now is something that you may not know about. And that is that the genetic code is pretty much optimal in minimizing errors. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's discuss what we mean by that. So let's suppose that you were given the task of, of designing intelligently a genetic code, okay? Well, you might say, well, translation is fundamentally important to a cellular operation, so we want to make sure that any, any mistakes, any mutations, or any misreadings uh, give you an amino acid which is pretty close in chemical properties to the one that you should have got. And if you could design a code like that, then, uh, then that would be great, okay? It would be robust to errors. So the question is, is our genetic code like that? I'm going to show you that it is. So here's the uh, actual genetic code. So what you can do is you can make in the computer alternative genetic codes just by permuting the labels. So here I'm permuting the labels, so I get new codes, albeit with the same pattern of degeneracy. There's 20 factorial, which is about 10 to the 18 possible genetic codes that you could have in the computer. Okay, so now I can say, all right, I, I've made this whole suite of genetic codes. How good are they at minimizing errors? And, uh, and there's a way that you can, you can compute that, uh, and I'm not going to go into uh, the exact metric that one uses. So there's a way that one can do that. So then one can ask, well, what should be the output if we take all our genetic codes that we've constructed in the computer, measure how good they are at minimizing errors, and then plot the probability distribution, how many times we see a particular code with a particular score at minimizing errors. And the smaller the, the number here is on the horizontal axis, the better the code is at minimizing error. Okay, so one possibility that you could have is something like this. You've got some 
you know, bell, roughly bell-shaped curve, and, uh, and then you, that's what you would get for any random genetic code. And then you look at the actual genetic code, it happens to be here in the middle in this, uh, in this sketch. And so you would say, okay, well, if that's what happens, then that means that the current genetic code is just a frozen accident. There was some ancestral organism. It, by accident, it happens to be the one that we're all descended from, all life on Earth. It had some genetic code. We all have the same genetic code as it, because if we had a different genetic code, then we'd be mistranslating uh, our genomes, we'd be getting the wrong amino acids and the wrong proteins, and so we wouldn't survive. And so the code must be what Francis Crick in 1968 called a frozen accident. It's an accident because it just comes from whatever was the last universal common ancestor, and it's frozen because if it evolves, the changes that it would happen would be deadly. Well, uh, the other option is something like this. You get a bell-shaped curve like this, and then the actual genetic code is somewhere down here in the tails. And if that's true, then that says, heck, the genetic code that we have is not a frozen accident. It had to have, have evolved. So here are the data. This was a, these are data taken from an experiment that was done by Freeland and Hurst in 1998. So they, they, they generated one million genetic codes, and they scored them in a way that I I'm not going to go into in detail, and the actual genetic code is way, way down here in the tail. Uh, so the, all these random codes look nothing like this actual universal genetic code, the canonical genetic code. And so the title of their paper was, the genetic code is one in a million. Okay, you generate one, a million genetic codes, and, and they're all worse than the one that we actually have at minimizing translation errors. Actually, we know that actually it's actually more, more like 100 times uh, better than that. Okay, so now we have to ask the question, how did the genetic code get like this? How is it possible for the code to evolve? Because Francis Crick already told us that it can't evolve. If you, if you change the genetic code, you're going to start making the wrong amino acids, you make the wrong amino acids, you make the wrong proteins, everything dies. So we have to figure out how to do it, and, uh, and this is uh, what we did uh, in, in this paper over here. And I want to walk you through, not, I'm not going to go into any of the, uh, the modeling and the math and so on. I want to give you a feel for how we can understand how it is possible for a code to evolve. Okay, so we're going to do a thought experiment, and we're going to do the thought experiment by uh, involving in our little story here the experts on codes. Who are the experts on codes? Spies. Spies. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> These characters from, from, from bad and, and possibly sexist 1960s TV shows. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do an experiment which involves uh, these spies. And we're going to imagine that the spies, of course, have their secret code book. So there's their code book, and the spies are trying to uh, communicate with uh, one disreputable member of their community, shown here on the right. And so we're going to do a thought experiment about what can happen when one spy tries to talk to, to the other. So let's start off with a, with a message, which is emitted over here. So this is the message that she wants to send. Uh, that is uh, received by, by uh, the, the person on the right, uh, uses their code book, and they correctly decode it as, as, uh, as that sequence of, uh, of amino acids. So, so far, everything is good. There's only a single message that you can deduce from the signal that you receive, okay? So this is the standard operating procedure. But the person on the right was chosen not just for their, for their glamorous sartorial style, but for the fact that they're very uh, um, incompetent. And so I want you to imagine that this person has lost half the code book. And so the code has now been uh, changed because you've, you've missed half the code book. And so now he, he translated as E equals MC squared, which means nothing to him, but it may mean something to, to you. And so what we've learned from this is that if you evolve or change the code, in this case by losing half the code book, uh, the message gets garbled. So, so far, Crick was right. Suppose, however, that we have a statistical code book. Not a code book that gives you one message, but a code book that gives you an ensemble of messages. And from those messages, you look at them and you say, oh, that makes no sense, that makes no sense, that makes no sense. Oh, phenylalanine. Okay, 
great, perfect, this must be the, what, they, what they meant. If you have a code plus its context, then if you, if you just have a probabilistic code book, you have a chance of being able to interpret the message. So the idea then was that if you have a probabilistic code book, then that means that you may, you may need to have st statistical proteins, a process of translation that doesn't just produce one protein, but produces many. And this would make complete sense. Because think about early life. Think about early life, which we know was, uh, was uh, dominated by endosymbiosis and all sorts of uh, events like that, which of course led to uh, many of the structures that we see in, in, in modern cells, uh, like mitochondria and chloroplasts and so on. So we can imagine that uh, early life was a bit like early automobiles. Okay? Remember how early automobiles were. A okay? hundred years ago, or a bit more than that, Automobiles did not look like they do today. They were rickety old things. They were sort of held together by string and sealing wax. And if I drove over to one of my friends in my car and, uh, and then the wheel fell off, you know, she would just say, well, no problem. I've got an old bicycle in the garage here. We'll just screw on the wheel of that old bicycle onto your car and, and you're, you're, you're good to go. That you could do, you could mix and match parts 100 years ago, 120 years ago, in the early cars. Try, do, try doing that today to a, to a Toyota Corolla, right? To taking a bicycle wheel and sticking it on when you've got a flat tire. That's not going to work at all. Modern cars are more highly evolved, and so they're very intolerant of anything that is not exactly right. And so we get the idea that evolved systems uh, become very intolerant of any kind of uh, ambiguity in, in what's the present, but systems that are very early on are very simple are able to tolerate uh, ambiguity, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, you can have this idea that the codes are floppy, that the statistical proteins that are made are not always the same proteins, and then somehow the messages uh, can, can uh, uh, be interpreted. So in other words, what I'm saying is that the code book and the message uh, can co-evolve as the organisms become more and more complex. You get a probability distribution of codes that can be the outcome of translation. And as the organisms become more and more complex, uh, that distribution gets narrower and narrower and very intolerant of any kind of errors. Now, you might ask yourself, well, wait, this doesn't make any sense. Selection pressure acts on the phenotype. It doesn't act on the code. But I want to show you that it acts on the code too. Okay? So here is a thought experiment, but for me it was an actual experiment. So I'm a physicist, so I like to write papers with mathematical equations. And so when I write a paper or a grant proposal, I write it in a thing called tech, a typesetting program that enables you to write equations. My biological colleagues, uh, of course, use uh, Microsoft Word, which is fine. And, uh, and so, <laughs> <coughs> hey, I guess the age of satire is not over yet. Um, and, and so, uh, and so you, you can imagine the situation where I am sitting with my friends in the Institute for Genomic Biology, and I'm saying, hey, let's write this proposal together. And uh, they say, sure, but so we're going to write it in, in, in Word, and I send them my stuff in, in tech. And of course, you know, it's, it's a complete disaster. And, uh, and, uh, and what happens is the, uh, our proposal never actually gets written, it never gets submitted, and so it never gets funded. Meanwhile, down the corridor, another person is collaborating with their co-workers. They just write it in Word, no, no problems. And even if their proposal was less good than ours, it still, uh, it still has a chance of being funded. So the code actually uh, does matter. Now, what is the basic way that the genetic code evolves in terms of its context? So here's, a, here's a, um, an interesting uh, factoid. Uh, this, this slide is now uh, quite old, but uh, this is, uh, this you may not recognize this person, this is Bill Gates. Uh, this is the late uh, Steve Jobs, both of them with examples of their, of their, of their company's uh, computers. And uh, actually, uh, my computer is a, is a Windows computer, but many people like, uh, like the Apple computers. And, and the reason that, um, you know, the, the, the reason I use a Windows computer, well, I mean, everybody does, right? Like 96% of all the world's uh, computers run uh, Windows, and a very small fraction run uh, the, uh, the Mac operating system. And the reason is that the Windows operating system is much better than... Oh, heck. <laughs> 
Well, that's a very inopportune time to have a blue screen of death. <laughs> the Windows operating system is, to put it mildly, uh, rubbish. Uh, it has all sorts of things like this. But the reason why it is so popular is not because it is the best computer system. It's because any program that you want to run, you can find it on Windows, but you may not be able to find it on the Mac OS. Uh, that may not be so true today, but it was certainly true uh, certainly 10, 10 years ago. And so what you learn from this is that the community, with access to the broadest range of innovations, has an evolutionary advantage. Anything that you want to do, you can find a gadget in that operating system that does it. And so what's important for platforms, for operating systems, for processes that are fundamental to cells like, the, like translation, is that, uh, is that you have um, the broadest reach. So what we did in our, in our mathematical model, which I'm not going to go into in detail, was we, we uh, considered a simulation, a digital life simulation, just like the computer virus ones that I showed you at the beginning of the call, at the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the talk, the ones uh, run by Niels Baricelli at the Institute for Advanced Study. So we have an asexual population of evolving, reproducing digital organisms like computer viruses. Their phenotype is a function of their uh, proteins, uh, and uh, the proteins are obtained by translating the genome with a code, but with, uh, with errors. The individual reproduction rate is a function of fitness, and the messages change are faster than codes and so, so forth. And so everything that's in this system uh, allows codes uh, to evolve due to selection at the phenotype through the mechanism uh, that I was showing you. So now what we're doing is simulating a whole population of different organisms which have different codes. And now the question is, which code is the one that wins? All right, so let's imagine that we've done this experiment. So I start off with a bunch of organisms, all of which have slightly different genetic codes, and they all co-evolve and are trying to deal uh, with the environment that they are, they're in, and we watch how they evolve in time. Now, we did two experiments here. I'm going to show you this graph, uh, and I'm going to show you another one similar to it in the, in the next slide. This, on the vertical axis, is the quality of the code. It's how good the genetic code is of those organisms, uh, minimizing error. And this is time over here. And here's what happens when you do this with regular vertical Darwinian evolution that you're used to. And you can see that what happens is, that, is uh, as, I, as I evolve the system, the, uh, the, um, the, the codes get better, smaller is better, and then eventually it stops and it just stays constant in time. And maybe if we waited like 100 times longer, maybe there'd be some other change down here or something like this. And you run it again, and for this one you get something like this, and you run it again, you get something like this. <coughs> and if you ask, I've got a whole distribution <coughs> of codes here. Um, what would I have got at random? Well, you can work that out, and it would be something like this. And so what I've learned is that without, uh, in this experiment with vertical evolution only, uh, I evolve organisms that have codes that are indistinguishable from random codes, and they're not unique, and they're certainly not optimal. But if I switch on horizontal gene transfer, then what happens is the codes uh, follow this blue trajectory here, and as you can see, end up uh, with, a, with a very optimal uh, code, um, and one which is very far from what you would get at random. And so what you learn from this is that the process of horizontal gene transfer as an evolutionary process uh, leads to optimality of the, uh, of the genetic code. Now, if we look at... Uh, at uh, how many codes we have in our system. Uh, that's uh, shown, uh, shown here. And again, the same thing is true, that if you just use uh, vertical evolution, uh, you, have, uh, you don't get much uh, uh, selection of the, of the genetic codes, as we saw on the previous slide. And, but if you switch on horizontal gene transfer, you get a universal genetic code. And so what we've learned from this is that the, the, the phase diagram of life must have looked something like this. So we're somewhere up here, we're in that, in that blob over here. Early on, the evolution was a uh, network process, shown schematically over here, rapid evolution. And then over here, we have the vertical evolution, which we saw was incredibly slow, and, uh, and that's the process that we are in today. And the somewhere over here was a transition that, uh, that Carl Woese liked to call the Darwinian transition, a kind of uh, phase transition 
between a collective network phase of life and a transition to uh, a life where organismal identity and individuality becomes more important. All right, so, so I, 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 I'm, I'm going to uh, skip my section on homo carousing. So I, I'm, I'm just going to skip through that. And, uh, and I wanted to uh, tell you about some of the things that are universal in biology. So anyway, the, bo the bottom line of this is that uh, we made a mathematical model of the evolution of, 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 a, of, of chiral autocatalytic self-replicators. And we could show that uh, you ultimately end up with, with broken, 100% a broken uh, chirality. Not just you get some right-handed or some left-handed, but a 100% effect. And that's the thing that we observe in biology, and that's the thing that uh, was difficult to explain, and, and, and we have made a theory for that. Okay, so um, let me just very quickly show you um, some examples of universality in modern biology. Even today, there are things that are universal, not just the evolutionary processes of, say, the genetic code, which may have happened uh, billions of years ago, but other things too. So one example of this is the universal statistics of gene expression. So if I have uh, genetically identical cells, they can exhibit different uh, protein copy numbers. That's something that we've known for about 20 years. That's called stochastic gene expression. The whole process of, of expressing genes is a random process. And so the protein copy numbers um, are not thermodynamically large. And so what happens is you have large fluctuations in protein copy numbers in, in cells. And here are experimental data uh, showing you for a, a variety of different, uh, of, of different uh, uh, cells here, and I'm not going to go through the, through the details, showing you that there's a universal distribution for the protein uh, copy number. Notice that all these data are collapsing onto one universal curve, which can be predicted. Um, this is very much like the universality I showed you in the magnetic system at the beginning of the talk. Um, here's another one which is absolutely fantastic and is still not uh, understood, and that is universal metabolism. So here's the experiment. So what you do is you go into the lab and uh, you get some paper and some mud and bits of egg and water and stuff like this, and you throw in some microbes, and then you make a bioreactor. And the bioreactor is producing, let's say, methane. Okay, and so you, you get this thing running, and uh, the bioreactor is uh, you're measuring, is producing a fixed rate of methane uh, coming out. You're feeding the bioreactor, and the rate of uh, methane coming out is a constant. So you say, well, that, that's great. Uh, well, I wonder what's in my bioreactor, what's in my chemostat. So you go and do a metagenomic survey, and, uh, and, uh, and what you find is that even though the methane that is coming out is constant, when you look at the community structure that you see, and here I'm showing you examples, uh, these are real data from, di from different, uh, from, from a, a reactor, what you find is that you know, let's say day 900, you go and uh, draw a pie chart showing you the different uh, 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 operational taxonomic units that are present in your system, and you say, that's it, I'm done. And then you, you know, your advisor says, aha, uh -huh, you're not done. Wait two years and do the experiment again. So you twiddle your thumb for two years and then do the experiment again. And then what you find is a completely different uh, set of uh, organisms that are in the, back, in the bioreactor, but it's still producing me methane at exactly the rate that it was before. Now, this experiment was actually done by uh, Anna Fernandez and, uh, and in, in 1999. And her advisor basically said this can't be true, we, we can't publish this, the, 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 we can't publish these data. But they published it in any case. And, and, and this has been replicated um, many times since. So what we've learned then is that the functional properties of a community are insensitive to taxonomic fluctuations. Here's, a, here's another example. This is from uh, um, uh, uh, Luca and, uh, and Derbley uh, and uh, Puffrey. Uh, this is decoupling function and taxonomy in the global ocean microbiome. And basically the same, the same story, that despite the constant metabolic function of the ocean microbiome, there are large uh, taxonomic fluctuations. And we don't have any idea uh, why this is, is happening. Okay, so these are examples of universal things that are going on right now, and they need to be understood, and they're telling us something about the collective properties of microbial communities. Now, 
if the NASA Astrobiology Institute was still, uh, was still a thing in existence, and I hadn't moved from Illinois to here and so on, one of the things that I would be thinking about doing is exploiting this. For example, suppose I want to know what are going to be the biosignatures of, a, of say, life that lives under the, uh, the ice of Enceladus. Well, it turns out that the metabolic output of microbial communities doesn't depend sensitively on what organisms are there. So if I have some knowledge of the geochemistry, I can then exploit this, this, uh, this functional redundancy to be able to make predictions about what uh, metabolic uh, biosignatures I might find. Okay, so let's end with uh, discussing about whether or not uh, universality is, is, uh, is or is not uh, useful. So here is an example of another uh, scaling law. And uh, this is a scaling law in ecology. This, was, uh, this scaling law uh, has been known since the uh, 1850s in England. Uh, these are data taking, taken from uh, bird lovers. Actually, not bird lovers. These are plants. Never mind. These are plants. Uh, people in England like two things. Well, actually, three things. They like uh, plants. They like birds and they like beer, or they like stink in the pie, or they like football, or whatever you want. But they like plants and they like, and they like birds. And so there's a lot of data going back, uh, you know, 150 years. Uh, um, and, and here is showing you the number of species as a function of the area of the, of the, of the habitat. And uh, what you can see from these data is that the number of species uh, scales like the area to the one quarter power. So you might say, here's a field, count all the bugs in the field, count all the plants in the field. Double the size of the field, count how many there are in there then. You might say, okay, the well, number of species are gonna double. Not true. It goes like roughly like the area to the one quarter power, not, not to the area itself. So this is a very important law because we can use it to make extrapolations. For example, if we know uh, how much deforestation happened today, in the Amazon, let's say, then we can figure out how many species might have got uh, affected by that. So that says uh, uh, these universal laws are useful. Here's an argument that says they're not useful. So here's an experiment that was actually done. This is Barrow at Colorado Island uh, in, uh, in Panama. And uh, this is a, an island which is beloved by ecologists because it has lots of trees and plants. And we know every single tree and every plant on that island. It's heavily studied. Okay? So you might ask yourself the following question. On this island, what is the number of species, fraction of species, with a given number of individuals? Okay? How many species have 100 individuals? How many species have 1,000 individuals? How many species have four individuals? And so on. Okay? And so you can produce a species uh, abundance curve. And, um, and then you, and you get data that looks like one of these curves here. I don't even remember which one it is. So that would be, uh, that would be a, a measurement, and you could make a theory for that, because you could say, well, we have to look at the soil, we have to look at the weather, we have to look at the interactions between the trees, the canopy, and so on and so forth. And if we had a detailed model, we could uh, probably predict uh, th this, this, this curve. But there's another way to think about it, which is just to say, well, let's just close it to just a random process. Something has to be the most abundant organism, okay? So whatever it is, that's it. We don't care what its name is, but then something else has to be the next most abundant, and you can work out a theory that looks like the general statistics that you would expect for abundance, just like the central limit theorem in, in statistics. And so, in, in a neutral theory, the species are functionally equivalent. They're not different. They don't occupy different geochemical or biological niches, metabolic niches. So you've got these two completely different theories. And one of them gives the black curve, one of them gives the green curve. They both explain the data equally well. So this is, uh, again, not, not helpful. So the upside of universality is that you can make predictions based on the minimal model, and that's a good thing. Like trying to predict the metabolic signature of putative life under the, under the ice cap of Enceladus. The downside of universality is that statistically similar results can be obtained from microscopic models that are completely different in their assumptions. And so if you have something universal at a high level of description, that means you can't understand the actual processes that went on that caused the thing in the first place. Okay, I want to end by asking, what do we miss 
if we don't understand universal phenomena. And I'm going to talk uh, about an example uh, that, that uh, may, may not be meaningful to, to some of you, or many of you even, but it doesn't matter. I want you to just understand the, the, the point. So this is about something in, uh, in superconductivity, and, uh, and, and there's a couple of students here from my class uh, on emergent states of matter, so they'll be familiar with these examples. So what is superconductivity? It's the, it's the fact that uh, you can have a current flowing through a material and there is no electrical resistance, no heat that comes out. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the idea of superconductivity. It's a superconductor. If you have it, you can make levitating trains and, and, and transmit power over long distances and solve all the world's problems. That was discovered in 1911. 1903, 1933, it was also discovered that superconductors don't just have a, a, a current that, that lasts forever and just go round and round forever, perpetual motion, they also expel magnetic fields. Okay, don't ask why, it doesn't matter. 20 years later, after that, it was discovered that actually, nope, it's not true. They don't expel magnetic fields. Well, some do, but some don't. Some allow magnetic fields to penetrate a superconductor, but in a lattice of so-called vortices or flux tubes in a way that is, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into but that can, that can happen. And then finally, oops, wrong thing. Then finally, uh, about 10 years or so after that, something called the uh, Jillison effect was discovered. The idea that I can have um, a current uh, uh, flowing um, which, which uh, will, will be uh, um, oscillating with a frequency that is just determined by quantum mechanics and doesn't depend on the material or anything like that. So you can use this to create uh, a universal standard of voltage and, and of time. Okay, so this, this is a complicated quantum mechanical effect and, and it took 50 years. And, and most of the people on, on this, who discovered these things ended up getting Nobel Prizes. These were very important things scientifically and technically. And the question is, why did it take so long to make these discoveries? Are physicists stupid? Well, maybe, but, uh, but the thing is this, it's even worse, because in my class, I derive all of these things in, in basically one lecture in a few lines of algebra from some mumbo jumbo that's written down here, okay? So what was going wrong? Well, what was going wrong was that people were focusing on the wrong level of description. And then I want to explain to you what I mean by that. Okay, so in the world of superconductivity, you have to make a superconductor, so that's a problem in quantum chemistry and material science. There's a theory that uh, applies to at least uh, the classic superconductors, but not the ones that everybody's excited about for the last uh, 30 years, the high temperature superconductors. So there's a theory of that, which is, which is very nice and so on. And then lastly, there's a theory, which, I, which I've given it this name here, it's basically a theory that looks at the quantum mechanical symmetries of, uh, of superconductors. Now, when we talk about uh, biology, we have another set of levels of description. So, so th this level is quantum chemistry. This is electrons moving around. And this is looking at symmetry and, and, and wave functions. All right. Here in, in biology, we start off with the lowest level of description with atoms and molecules. There's an intermediate level of description where we you know, we talked about with translation. We look at uh, DNA, we look at how elastic it is and how proteins fold and things like this. We look at liquid-liquid uh, intracellular complexes and things like that in, in cell biology. And then finally, on the, la on the larger scale, uh, I talked about the dynamics of how systems evolve, the dynamics of evolving systems like the genetic code. So those are levels of description. These levels of description answer different questions. So in superconductivity, well, Quantum chemistry and material science says, how do you make a stuff? What's the specific recipe of putting the atoms together in such a way that you make a particular superconductor? This, uh, this, uh, this intermediate level of description tells you about what is the basic mechanism by which uh, you know, electrons form what's called a Cooper pair, a composite boson inside a superconductor, and then do something called Bose condensation. So this is a sort of more detailed uh, uh, description that applies to, um, to many different superconductors. And this level of description, this symmetry uh, wave function quantum mechanical theory, describes why the phenomenon of superconductivity exists at all, how you can get all the phenomena of superconductivity just from one very simple uh, mathematical description. 
Now, in the, in the world of biology, atoms and molecules tells us something about how specific biopolymers interact and fold, undergo template-directed synthesis, and so on and so forth. If you want to understand those questions, you have to deal with atoms and molecules. There's no way around it. If you want to understand um, the, you know, the basic functional cellular processes, you don't need to have such a, a detailed description. You can just think about uh, you know, phase separation inside cells and, and sort of bending rigidity of cell membranes and DNA and so on and so forth. And if you want to understand why the phenomenon of life exists at all, well, that's surely a question that would be answered if we understood more about the dynamics of evolving systems. Different levels of description apply to different levels of universality. So if I look in, in, in the quantum chemistry and material science, that tells us something about very specific materials, like yttrium, barium, copper oxide, or something like this. If I want to look at this level of description, it tells us something about what are called weak coupling superconductors. And finally, this level of description, uh, this symmetry wave function theory, tells us about all superconductors, whether they're made in a material science lab or whether they occur in the, in the heart of a, of a neutron star. In biology, this level of description applies to very specific biopolymers, you know, the chemical structure of RNA or DNA or some particular protein. The uh, elasticity theory uh, for DNA and so on and so forth tells you about the physics of subcellular uh, components and the dynamics of evolving systems would, uh, would be applying to all life. And just in the same way that a universal Turing machine with a von Neumann architecture applies to all things that we call computers. Now, why do we need this universal level, this top level description of, 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 of stuff? Well, if I have a superconductor and I want to understand uh, this level of description, not only does it tell me that superconductors exist, but it also tells me everything that a superconductor can do. It tells me the Meissen effect, the vortex lattice, the Josephson effects. It tells me how a superconductor responds to electromagnetic fields. So if I don't have this, I can't predict how a superconductor responds to an electromagnetic field, and that's a big problem. By regarding superconductors as collections of atoms, we are missing the emergent laws that act at the system scale and govern the large-scale response to electromagnetic fields. Just like uh, um, when we were looking at our bioreactor, it produces methane at a constant rate. Uh, if we just focus on the, on the, on the uh, on the bacteria that are in there, we won't be able to understand that. We need to understand how metabolism can be emergent in a community. This problem we know how to solve. It took us 50 years to do it, and we had to rejigger the way we think about physics. For living systems, uh, we know that this level of description would apply to all of life. And what happens if we don't have it? We can't predict the response of living systems to selective perturbations. We can't tell what happens when you apply antibiotics or herbicides or insecticides or chemotherapy to somebody with cancer. Okay? And, and, and we know what happens in the real world. Whenever we do these interventions and treat living systems as engineered systems, what happens is they fight back. They evolve. The cancer tumor evolves and, you, and, you, and, you, and the chemotherapy stops being effective. Roundup stops being effective against weeds. Antibiotics stop being effective against bacterial infections, and so on and so forth. By regarding biology as complicated physical systems, we are missing the emergent laws that act at the system scale and govern the large-scale response to control perturbations. And we do not know how to solve that problem. All right, if, you, if uh, you want to read about any of these things that I've been talking about, uh, there is an article I wrote uh, called Life is Physics uh, with, uh, with Carl Rose and another one on, on the statistical mechanics of early life uh, in, uh, in Phil Trans A. Um, this one was called Life is Physics for the following reason. When I used to go to astrobiology conferences, on the first day, somebody would get up and show some extremely complicated chemical pathway that they thought might have existed in the RNA world or the sugar world or lipid world or whatever was the, was the fad of the time. And they would say, life is chemistry. And I fundamentally disagree. Chemistry doesn't, it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter. You can't build a superconductor without atoms and molecules, but you have to understand the emergent physical laws as well, the, the dynamical processes that go on. And so that's why we talk about this as life uh, as physics. All right, so did we learn new physics when we studied biological, uh, biological systems? Uh, yes, we do. We, we realize that they actually do things that physical systems don't. Are there universal phenomena in biology? Yes, genetic code, homochirality, patterns of gene expression, distribution of species, metabolism, and so on. Do they reveal things that are important? Well, yes, they, they tell us about the phase diagram of life. They tell us about cell structure and principles and how things evolve. And what do we miss by not understanding universal phenomena? We've, we don't understand why life exists at all, and we don't understand how, to, how biological systems respond to control perturbations. So, so here is, uh, here is the, the, uh, the history of life. We know that somewhere around here was a homochiral transition in the genetic code, the Darwinian transition, and finally 3.8 billion years ago, the last universal common ancestor. All of this happened super fast because it was dominated uh, by network effects. And, while I, and what uh, I didn't tell you about this in detail, autocatalysis leads to 100% homochirality, Horizontal gene transfer and networks uh, drive the evolution of the unique optimal genetic code. And horizontal gene transfer eventually becomes ineffective compared to vertical selection. And you get this transition to the vertical phase of life that we are in today. I want to end with a, a quote, uh, since I'm a physicist. I study biology uh, not because I love biology. I have a sort of love-hate relationship with biology, but, but because it teaches me things that, are, that expands the scope of physics. So I'll ask not what physics can do for biology, build you a better microscope, build you a better, better computer simulation, understand the, uh, the uh, structure of some protein. I'll ask instead what biology can do for physics. It can teach us wonderful things. Thank you very much. So I'm very recently coming to appreciate this, the importance of this horizontal gene transfer, but mechanistically, I don't understand how, like, why this trade-off is tied to optimizing the genetic code. What, what, you don't understand why what? Me mechanistically, I don't understand why its massive advantage is tied to having a suboptimal genetic code. The, 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 so the question is, uh, why, why, why is, if I understand it right, why is horizontal gene transfer um, important in, in evolving the genetic code? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, the fundamental reason is this. What I showed you in the, in the simulations um, was that if you, if you just have vertical evolution, which, uh, which I explained to you what it is, um, you kind of get trapped in local minima. Okay? So horizontal gene transfer is a very non-local shuffling of genes that wouldn't otherwise happen. And so it's a much faster way of exploring the space of possibilities. And so what happened in early life is organisms were very porous. There's a lot of endosymbiosis. So you know, today we, we only, you know, you and I are not horizontally transferring genes. The bacteria in our guts are. Um, but in early life, Organisms would sort of pop, go through each other and collide and, and uh, subsume each other and so on. And so there was a very natural built-in mechanism for genes to be horizontally transferred. And so when we, when we model that in our, in our simulations, what we see is that it is enormously effective in accelerating the evolution rate. So, so bottom line is horizontal gene transfer is just one way to accelerate evolution. And if you accelerate evolution, you don't get stuck in local minima. If you don't get stuck in local minima, as it were, you then find the true best code or the best whatever it is that you're optimizing. And, and that's, why, that's why it works. So did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. What was, the bit that, what was the bit that I hadn't explained that made the penny drop? I, I saw empirically that it was true, but the mechanism... Oh, OK. So I explained that. Yep. Got it. Thank you. OK. Yep. Hi there. Hi, uh, I'm Maddie from um, MIT. Um, great talk. I was kind of interested, based on your like um, idea of evolution of this like 
pro genote like horizontal gene transfer dominated system evolving to this Darwinian phase, where do you think kind of the universality of like essential dogma kind of starts to evolve when we think of like the genetic code of like codons to proteins and DNA? Like, is that something that might have existed with like this pre-state or would this be something we only see with like the rise of like more well, of a Darwinian? Well, I, I don't think the central dogma even exists today. Okay, we, 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 know, we know that, that's, we know that, that that's not true. We know that there are, there are ways that, um, that, that there can be you know, post-translational modifications, you have a retrotranscription and so on and so forth. So, so organisms, uh, even today, can rewrite their, their, their genome. And so, um, you know, when, when did the, you know, of course, we, 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 you know, the first people didn't, you know, did, didn't know about that. Crick called it the central dogma as a, as a joke. Um, but today we know that you know, viruses are doing this uh, all the time, so we have lots of endogenous retroviral DNA in our own genomes. So, so I'm not so convinced that, um, that uh, the, um, the central dogma world, as it were, ever existed, or at least even exists, uh, even exists, exists now. But the extent to which, you know, Genome editing, self genome editing, um, evolved in time. That's not something that I've looked at. But you certainly could, you could, you could imagine it uh, certainly being accelerated uh, during the uh, progenote era, for example. But it's going on today. So, so, um, so, um, I don't know, did, I, did I answer your question, or did I just dismiss the premise of the question and so swept it under the rug that way? No, it's a very fascinating, fascinating answer. I would say biologists would have a lot to discuss with so, you. Say it again. I would say biologists have a lot to discuss with you about um, the idea of the central dogma. But I think that is a fascinating way to think about yeah. it. Yeah. No. No. I mean. I mean. I mean. You know. It may be. It may be broadly true, but there's certainly lots of exceptions to it. And and so uh, and that's why I say it's not like it really has to happen. It's it's just. You know the balance of, you know, okay. Mostly these things work, but the, the fact um, they, they, they're not forbidden by any symmetry or any law, laws of physics or anything like this. So, so, so how, you know, f fundamentally, I, I think the the main principle of trying to under underlie genome uh, genome stability is essentially reproducibility. In other words, you know, if, if everything is fluctuating too much. Then uh, you're making too many possibilities, and, and then you, you're getting um, generalists, as it were, but not no specialists. And so it's really tied up with, you know, whether the organisms are optimized for their particular environment and for the for you know for where, where their niches in, in in the ecosystem. So I think these these things are balanced like that. Thank you. Sure. So I'm very excited to see you here because I'm also a physicist by training, and I have two questions for you. So first of all, can there be nuclear signatures for life? And second question is, we just can observe 5% of our universe. The rest of the universe is dark energy, dark matter. Can there be dark matter life? Um, OK. I, uh, so, so the question is, are there nuclear signatures of life? When you say nuclear, what do you mean by that? At the nuclear level. Like we talk about biosignatures of life. Can there be signatures at the nuclear level? Do, I don't understand what you mean, sorry. Like, uh, can there be nuclear physics going on which can lead to life? Oh, I, I see, I see. Um, I don't know about n n nuclear. It's certainly at atomic. I mean, there, there, there's... Um, I, I don't really know... The, I don't know the answer to your question, but, but I'll, gi I'll give you an example. There's, um, th there is a particular excitation... Um, in carbon, the, 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 the Hoyle excitation. And, and it's probably the, the, the first, or maybe only successful application of the anthropic principle, uh, where he guessed that there had to be such an excitation for some process to occur that was essential for, for life. And, and indeed, it was later discovered to be true. So I don't really know the answer to your question. It's not impossible, because this Hoyle example is, is a sort of a very strange one. It's obviously something that, if you take a sort of perspective that you should be looking at uh, large scales of, of systems, you would never think that there would be this kind of thing happening. But we also know in physics that there is a scale interference and that small uh, negligible effects can have large consequences. And I have a whole other talk about, about that in trying to understand um, the, 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 the tree-like evolution of life, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, uh, so, so I don't, I don't really know. 
And there was a second question. A second question was, we can only observe 5% of our universe because the rest of the universe is right, dark. Right. So can there be dark matter? Can there be dark matter and can it have, can it have life? Yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, basically, I, t I, t I tend, so, okay, somebody's very, very enthusiastically waving at the back. So, so, I, uh, so, I, so uh, I, I, one second, so, hang on, so, I, so I, I think that, that life is, you know, is essentially an inexorable consequence of the laws of physics. I don't think it's unique or an accident. So yes, so that's why I answer that. But I have no scientific reason for, for answering your question in the affirmative. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, hello, Professor. Like, I just cannot express like how excited I am after your talk. So thank you, thank you so much. Actually, I have the similar notion. Like, uh, I the like uh, like whatever you have presented here. Like, I'm I'm literally feeling we share the similar vibe. Actually, I'm the second year PhD student in astronomy, and I have a degree in physics. And um, so, like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little nervous, but I have I have a lot to talk. So. Uh, So uh, yeah, I, I want to ask like uh, what uh, since uh, yeah like I also like the earth centric like investigation of life it 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 really doesn't convince me to for, like to to see the life outside the universe and so like I'm I'm really interested to study the like uh, physical e evolution like how how we can study the life like outside the universe like and 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 it is true that uh, we should have a generic uh, like generic definition how should life look like. So that's why I'm very much interested in the thermodynamic evolution of life. So I just want to know like what are your uh, thoughts about like what do you what do you think about like because there are uh, many uh, researchers who are doing uh, great work on that the, on the thermodynamic evolution of life. So I just want to know your th thoughts on that. And I'm like I'm super excited to work on, on this field. And uh, yeah, like even uh, I'm in second year, and I like I have already decided I want my second PhD in biophysics, and I want to study the thermodynamic evolution of life. So yeah, thank you. Well, th thank you, thank you very much for your kind words. And um, now I don't I don't quite understand what is the question that you're asking me though. Okay, so yeah, I, I want to know like because uh, oh, the, the the microphone is next to you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So. Uh, there is uh, the, the 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 third law of like uh, thermodynamics. Third law of thermodynamics, yes. Yeah, the, the thermo uh, yeah the entropy. <coughs> so it it says like um, every natural uh, laws in the world they have a particular direction, and it find this is if that's that's if if we think about that that's that's itself is a is a very great like itself is a very great. It it tells like every natural you know process in the world they have a specific direction. And what I feel oh. like, yeah. What I what I feel like that's that's my hypothesis. Like that, life is not the you know the the most like the the most probable state of state of the of the nature. Nature doesn't want life. That that's what I think. And I want to study this uh, with uh, like thermodynamic evolution of life. That's why yeah uh, yeah okay. I want to study that. So I wanted to know your uh, okay, opinion so on I that. Okay, so I think I I think I'm I sorry I was so long. <clears throat> I think I can paraphrase uh, your, your question. So uh, tell me if this is a, a reasonable paraphrasing of your question. Why, why, do, uh, why does life inexorably become more and more complex? And, and, I, and I think that is a very important foundational question because you might say, okay, let's suppose you believed in the RNA world, which, which I actually, as, as it happens, I, I don't believe in it, but, but, let, but let's suppose you did, then you might say, well, okay, so I get these, uh, these, uh, these autocatalytic uh, uh, replicators, uh, I have RNA doing all the functions of, of, of life, uh, why isn't the world just you know, knee deep in uh, self-replicating RNA molecules, you know, why, why do we have us and elephants and, and blue whales and things like this? And so, so I think the, the, you know, the, the, the fundamental question is, why do you have this uh, evolution to greater and greater uh, complexity? And I think that's a, um, that's a question that we don't have a good answer for. Now, I'll tell you what happens when we try to model living systems. Uh, when we try to model living systems, say in a computer, you make an artificial ecosystem, lots of things interacting with each other, and you run it, and what happens is it, it does evolve in complexity just a little bit, and then it just stops evolving. 
It just stay, stays constant. And it really, the simulation does not evolve more and more arbitrarily complex life as time proceeds. So we, we try to figure out uh, what is the fundamental mechanisms, genetic mechanisms, that could enable this increase, that give you, as you put it, this directionality of, of life. And, and what we discovered was this, um, and it relates to things I emphasized in the talk. Mostly, we, when we think about evolution, you know, you read the newspapers, you think about uh, mutations and point mutations and things like this. I don't think those things are very important uh, at all for evolution on the large scale. What we discovered uh, in, in computer simulations was that there's two things that cause life to inexorably get uh, more and more complex. And that is, first of all, you have horizontal gene transfer. So you have mechanisms that enable um, essentially an evolving system to really find its, its local maximum or local minimum or optimum. Uh, and the other is gene duplication. Gene duplication is very powerful because you make a copy of a gene and then one copy goes off and carries on doing what it was supposed to be doing. The other one can evolve without deleterious effect on the organism. And when you look in, in the evolutionary uh, history of, of life and you look at uh, uh, genomes, you see throughout this pervasive influence of horizontal gene transfer, certainly in microbial organisms, and, um, and, and, uh, and gene duplication. Uh, and you see gene duplication in all, all branches of life. Um, so, so I think what you have to try to understand is the, the, the interplay between these different uh, uh, processes at the genetic level then have consequences for the large-scale complexity of organisms. So we, we, we built um, what I think is the first um, um, computer model of an evolving ecosystem which has continual growth of complexity uh, due to those particular uh, genetic uh, operators. And uh, it's not a very realistic model and the model and the method of the, the way we measured complexity was completely unrealistic. Uh, we measured it by the length of the genome as opposed to something like Kolmogorov complexity or some other algorithmic complexity measure. But, um, but it, it, it does show you that certain genetic processes can give rise to, when they interact with the environment, and that was important in our, in our calculation, uh, can give rise to this direction of life, this ever-increasing growth of complexity. So that's the best I can do in answering your question. Is that helpful? Thank you. Okay, unfortunately, we've run out of time for questions, so hopefully you can find Nigel at the dinner. But let's thank our speaker one more time.